Well, good morning. How many of you guys would like to receive a check in the mail every single day? <laughs> I, was, I was hoping that, you know. And uh, it would be the same amount, exactly the same amount every single day. And there would be a couple of rules that would go with that money. Uh, you had to spend it every single day. You couldn't carry over anything to the next day. But you would always have the same amount every single day. That'd be pretty nice, wouldn't it? How about if that check was for $86,400 every day? Woo! To, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> but in reality, we are given something that uh, is more precious than money. Our society would actually say that time is money. And each and every day, every one of us has 86,400 seconds or 1,440 minutes in a day. Over the next four weeks, we're going to be talking about the idea of stewardship. And uh, I know that any time the pastor starts to mention stewardship, people like reach for their wallets. Um, and hopefully that's to reach into them and pull them out and put... Okay. Amen. Um, but you know what? Stewardship, honestly, is a whole lot more than just money. Stewardship is not just money, but it's a lifestyle. And so over the next four weeks, today we're going to talk about time. Uh, Michelle Dunn did these awesome panels for me. Didn't she do a great job? Um, yeah, I think that's appropriate for us to clap. Um, Damon had a little bit to do with it, too, I think. he, Yeah. Um, this week, we're going to talk about time and uh, the stewardship of our time. Next week, we're going to talk about the church being a good steward of the calling that God has placed on the church. The third week, we're going to, we're going to talk about what is it that God expects from us in stewardship. And then finally, the last week, we're going to talk about Benjamin Franklin. No, um, the last week we will um, talk about money. But stewardship is actually incredibly important for each of us. Um, time is really a strange thing. It doesn't speed up and it doesn't slow down. We all get the same amount every single day. You can't get more if you're rich and you don't get less if you're poor. The man in India gets the same amount of time as you and I do in Emmett, Idaho. And yet God has called us to be stewards of our time. As a matter of fact, I would even say it's not how do you spend your time. But I would say, and I would use the word invest. How do you invest your time? I want us to turn to uh, the book of Romans chapter 13. If you have your Bibles, you're welcome to turn there. Uh, Romans chapter 13 uh, starting with verse 11. And Paul talks to us a little bit about time. And he says, And do this understanding the present time. The hour has already come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. Let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. Paul pretty much confronts us here about the way in which we use our time. And I want us to look at a couple of things through that passage of scripture that Paul is saying to us. I think the first thing that Paul is saying to us is that time is short. Our time on this earth is short. Do you believe that? James chapter 4, verse 14 says, Why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears a little while and then vanishes. Time is short. Some of us have more time than others. And some of us in the room may have less time than we think. Others of us may have more time. 
than we think. But time is short. In every capacity, we need to be aware of the way in which we're using our time. I would also say that it's in response to our time being short, Paul says in there that it's time to wake up. When we're awake, we're aware of what we're doing, right? Well, hopefully, when you're awake, um, you're aware of what you're doing. Uh, Several years ago now, my wife uh, told me that I had a snoring problem. Any men have your wives tell you that you, you snore? Okay. And uh, to be honest with you, I, I didn't believe her. And uh, I, I thought, oh, come on, it's not that bad. You know, it's really, it's really no big deal. Uh, you're just being oversensitive and, you know, should be fine. Well, <clears throat> my wife had had it <laughs> with the snoring. And one night, she came into our room and videotaped me sleeping. And it just so happens that this last week, I looked back in some old video things, and I found that video of me snoring. And so I'm going to play you (laughs) just a brief segment of the video, and you tell me if my wife had a legitimate uh, concern. Now, how would you like to sleep next to that each night? Uh, That really honestly (laughs) was me sleeping. Um, Or at least I was sleeping. Um, But uh, it was shortly after that that uh, I took the advice of my wife and went and had a sleep study done and uh, had all kinds of fun electrode things attached to my head. Went, try, <laughs> they want you to go to sleep with all this stuff on your head. It's like, oh, sure, I'll sleep just great. Um, and uh, they uh, did the sleep study and uh, come to find out that, uh, and I don't know how they can test this, but they can, that I was waking myself up on average 66 times a minute. No, an hour, sorry, 66 times. Uh, Wait a minute, that would be a lot. Um, 66 times an hour, I was waking myself up. And it was amazing because I felt tired all the time. Um, I was grouchy and irritable. My children would say, you know, more grouchy and irritable um, than normal. And uh, after I eventually got used to sleeping with that, because I have sleep apnea, and uh, after I... uh, got used to that mask, um, not only did I sleep well, my wife slept well, my marriage improved. It was amazing. Um, My wife no longer threatened to kill me in the middle of the night. Um, But my greatest fear for us is that not so much that we lose out on physical sleep, although physical sleep is important. But I think something that can happen to us is that sometimes we fall asleep spiritually. And over time, over a long period of time, it's easy for us to kind of get into the habit of not caring maybe so much. Sometimes we see things or hear about things in the world and we become desensitized to the issues that are going on around us. And folks, if you're not paying attention, if you're not frustrated, if there's some things that don't bother you, you're not paying attention. Um, We need to be awake, and I don't, I I would not want the church to be found asleep. 
We must wake up from our sleep because our salvation is getting closer. And when Paul is writing this, he's talking about when Christ is going to return. And you know what? He is coming back. Now, there's all kinds of debate about when he's coming back. Uh, anybody that tells you they have a specific date in mind, eh, thank you for playing. Because Scripture says that no man knows the hour uh, of when he will return. But we've got, uh, we've got your post-tribbers who think that the rapture is going to happen at the end of the tribulation. You've got your mid-tribbers who, you know, those are the folks that think, well, I can only handle so much. And then uh, there's your pre-tribbers that say, man, get me out of here. I'm a pan-tribber. I don't know if you've ever heard of a pan-tribber. I just kind of figure it's all going to pan out the way God wants it to and uh, follow him and, and we'll be all right. Um, but we need to be aware that he is coming back. And scripture does say that it'll be in the twinkling of an eye, that it will be uh, when we least expect it. And so the question there about our salvation is near. When Christ returns, how do you want him to find you? If he were to return in your lifetime, they were concerned about because that at the early church, they honestly believed that Christ was going to return any time. So how do you want to be found when Christ returns? Do you want to be found bickering and arguing and quarreling? Do you want to be found living your life the way that you really know you probably shouldn't? Or do you want to be found righteous? Do you want to be found living the life that God has called you to live? And in the midst of this, maybe as we analyze how we spend our time, maybe it's time for a change. Maybe it's, a time, it's time for us to consider a change in the way that we spend our time, in the way that we use the time that God's given us. Paul goes on there in that passage of Scripture, and he says the night is over. Night times, uh, dark and light throughout Scripture represents righteousness and evil, right? Darkness is represented by evil, um, and uh, light is uh, represented by righteousness. And when you get up in the morning, don't you uh, make some changes? Did you make some changes before you came to church this morning from when you first got out of bed? Uh, I'm hoping you did, Bradley. I'm really hoping you did. But you probably took a shower, or maybe you took one last night before you went to bed. I'm hoping that you maybe brushed your teeth. Um, you know, ladies, you may have put on some makeup. And, uh, you know, I've had uh, people ask me, well, how much makeup do you think is too much? And I said, <laughs> however much you need. <laughs> is, you know, if the barn needs painted, paint it. Okay, just kidding. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, hopefully, that, I'm going to get in trouble for that one, aren't I? <laughs> um, <clears throat> but hopefully you made some changes this morning when you got up. I, I don't see anybody here in their pajamas, and I'm thankful for that uh, this morning. But uh, throughout, uh, throughout Scripture, this idea of dark and light, it's nighttime is over. The time for evil is over. If, you're a, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, dabbling in sin is not acceptable. The night is over, folks, and it's time to put those things aside. One of the things that we do when we wake up in the morning is we change our wardrobe, right? Trust me, you, you'll, you're glad that I took a shower and, and got ready this morning and that I put on something else other than what I wore to bed last night. And we're all glad that you all have done the same thing. We are to clothe ourselves with Jesus Christ. When I uh, worked at Safeway, one of the jobs that I had was uh, cleaning out the machines that, uh, you know, in Oregon they have a deposit on all of the cans and bottles. Um, and uh, I remember as a kid going and collecting these. But they have machines that you stick the bottles and the cans into. It keeps track of how many you turn in. And as it goes through the machine, it crunches the cans or it shatters the bottles and they drop into a bin 
and then periodically you have to go by and empty those bins. The machine prints off a little receipt. You take it into the grocery store and they apply it to your groceries or, the, or they'll give you the cash. The one thing that I found out though was that when people turn their cans and their bottles in, they don't always empty them 100%. Now when they have the cans, it just is a place for cans. It's not just pop cans, it's beer cans as well. And can I tell you the combination of old beer and old soda combined together inside of a machine that's metal in the heat does not smell very good. And we'd have to pull those bins out. The cans, we had a big, they were as a big plastic bag and we would have to take those out and periodically, I tried not to, but periodically there would be juice in the bottom of those bags. And if you got a hole in the bag and you were trying to haul that thing out, sometimes that would get on you. And it was a smell that you really you'll never forget. And I couldn't wait to get home from work and change my clothes because they reeked. It smelled awful. As a matter of fact, just the thought of that smell still kind of makes me nauseated. The calling of our life as Christians is to take off the old and put on the new. But sometimes we keep that dirty wardrobe hanging in the closet. And folks, I can promise you this. It will make everything else stink. We can't be waffling back and forth between two positions. It's the time has come for us to change. And if you as a Christian are waffling back and forth, you really need to seriously consider how you're using your time. The other thing is this, is we're not walking in the darkness anymore but it is time to walk in the daylight. It's, Paul says, let us walk properly as in the daytime. In the daytime, we can see pretty clearly. In the daytime, we can see where we're headed. In the daytime, everything is clear to us. But when we dabble and mess around in sin, things become more and more clouded, especially for, I believe, for believers who are, who are kind of trying to walk the fence, things become very clouded, things become very unclear, but I believe when we walk in righteousness that we, things, we see things clearly. So I believe that God is calling us to walk properly. We're to walk in the light. It's important for us as believers to walk properly one of the greatest things that keeps people from wanting to be Christians is Christians who don't walk properly. The world knows how we're supposed to walk. You, re you recognize that? And, and when we don't walk properly, that doesn't speak well of Christ. We're also not to walk, uh, uh, we're to walk not like the world. Paul says uh, there's six things in this, in verse 13. He talks about carousing, drunkenness, sexual immorality, sensuality, quarreling, and jealousy. The list covers everything from wrong attitudes to wrong behavior. And Paul's writing this letter to Christians, folks. He's writing this letter to Christians in the early church in Rome. So I'm going to guess that there was probably an issue with this in the church. And I'm going to guess that probably time hasn't improved the way the church is. And I'm going to guess that these are some things that we probably str had some struggle with in the church. But Paul says here, he doesn't say, hey, it'd be a good idea if you didn't do these things. He says, it's time to stop. It's time to stop doing these things. The first on the list there is carousing. In other versions of scripture, it actually says orgies. And what this means in the original language is excessive revelry and partying. 
It debases people. Partying for the fact of just partying. I can't tell you how many times I've heard people say, what are you doing tonight? Well, I'm going to the bar, or I'm going to go to the club, or I'm going to... Why? Excessive involvement in that, folks, will affect your life spiritually. The second one is pretty straightforward, and it talks about drunkenness. There's a reason why we in the Church of the Nazarene take a stand on alcohol that we do. And that stand is abstinence, by the way. Now, I am not saying that if you drink that you're a sinner, that you're going to go to hell. Okay, I'm not saying that. However, what I would say is this. Alcohol causes you to lose control. There's a reason why you get arrested if you drive drunk. It does shut down your inhibitions. And I just think as Christians, my personal stance on this is I don't want anything to change my inhibitions. I got enough problems with the sin and, and uh, with, the, with the temptations and stuff that I deal with. I don't need anything else to help diminish that. And so, folks, we need to stay away from that stuff. I honestly believe that. The third term is sexual immorality, which is so prevalent in our society today. So prevalent. To the point that when people become more disturbed about the stance that a fast food restaurant takes on a particular issue versus the way that they live their own personal lives, we've got a problem. Sexual immorality tears us down. Matter of fact, Jesus' standard when it comes to sexual, Im sexual immorality was not just abstinence. He took it a step further. And he said, if you even look on a woman with lust in your heart, that you've committed adultery. It's not just the act, it's, a, it's an attitude of the heart. I would venture to say that all of these things are not just actions, but each of these actions stem from an attitude of the heart. The fourth term he uses here is sensuality or shamelessness. The fact that honestly, there are some people, they, they don't just, they're not just okay with sin, they boast about it. They brag about it. Have you seen that before? And certainly, Christians, this is not something that we need to be involved with. But evidently, in the church in Rome, there was an issue there. I don't think Paul would have written it in if there wasn't something to it. The fifth one that he lists is, jealous, is, is quarreling. I'll tell you what, that's another one of the things in the church that, that makes people not want to be a part of the church by the body of Christ because we're the only army that shoots our wounded. Let me say that again. We're the only army that shoots our wounded. When someone in the body of Christ fails a lot of times, we feel like it's our job to crucify them. When in reality, that's already been done for all of us. Quarreling and fighting and bickering, that's not God's plan for our time. The sixth one that he talks about is jealousy or envy. And it's so easy to look at other people's lives and be of the things that they have or, or the things that, that they're able to do. And that honestly has no place in the life of a believer. It comes down to how you spend your time. Are we going to waste our time doing these things? Because using your time for other things not only benefits you, but it benefits those that you come into contact with. So, so what do we do with all this? How do, we, how do we deal with our time? 
I would say that it's, first of all, that it's time to put Jesus in control of your life. When you try to direct your life, I guarantee you, eventually, you're going off a cliff. It's time to put Jesus in control of your life. When I mow the lawn at home, I don't wear these clothes. I wear my grubbies. I've got some tennis shoes that are old tennis shoes that are pretty worn out, and they got big, huge green stains all around the shoes, and though I wear those shoes to mow the lawn in. When I go to perform a wedding, I don't wear those clothes. I wear something else. And folks, I also don't put on the wedding clothes over the top of the old clothes. That'd be pretty disgusting, don't you think? And folks, we have to make the decision, are you for Christ or aren't you? I'm convinced one of the biggest ways I think that we rob God is with our time. Because sometimes it's easy to say, well, I'll just write a check. Put it in the plate. And don't get me wrong. We, we need you to do that. We desperately need you to do that as a church. But we also need your time. The kingdom needs your time. And in a lot of ways, I know that time is more valuable than money. Where are you making a difference in the kingdom of God? Where is it that God has you serving? I hope that you don't just come, sit in a seat, go home and come back next week. I hope that you're involved in investing your time in the life of others. Because that's what God has called us to, is to be good stewards of our time. And then in verse 14, Paul says, make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. We will spend our time gratifying the flesh or we'll spend our time gratifying Christ. So how are you using your time? Doug and Connie, I'm going to ask you guys to come if you would. I know I'm going to throw a curveball at you um, this morning. Um, And I'd like us to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. And I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know where it is that God finds you today in regards to your time. But you see, really, none of our time is ours. It's God's time. If we're submitted to Christ, all of it's his time, isn't it? Well, we talk about that with money, right? I mean, and we'll get there in a couple of weeks, right? That all of it's God's. It all comes from him. Time is the same. It's all his. And I don't know this morning if maybe the Lord's talking to you about the way that you use your time. Or maybe he's challenging you to be involved in a ministry of some kind. Maybe he's challenging you to start a ministry of some kind. You ever have thoughts in your mind? Well, you know what? The church ought to do this. Really? Maybe you're the one that's supposed to do that in the church. 
There's plenty to be done. Amen? And each of us is of vital importance to the kingdom of God. I'm going to invite us to stand and we're going to sing and if you if you'd like to respond at the altar this morning it is open. Let's just tarry for just a moment and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you this morning. Father, we thank you for the gift of 86,400 seconds that you give us each day. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be good stewards of the time that you've given us. Lord, I ask that you would help us to not mess around with the things of the world, but that, Father, that you would, you have called us to live righteous, holy lives. And Lord, I ask that each of us would make that the desire of our hearts, that you would give us the desire to be holy. And Father, I pray that you would speak to each of us about how it is that you would have us spend our time. May we be about your kingdom's work. We love you, Father, and thank you for your presence with us this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.